Welcome everyone. This is Robin Duncan, and this is our Course in Miracles church service. Today we are on part four of our healing relationships series, and this one is on practical application. You know, last time we talked about practical steps, but I think one of the tougher things to do is to figure out how to apply these principles of A Course in Miracles in those daily relationships. So let's go ahead and get started with an opening prayer. Let's turn inward and be in that calm place. He assures us that there is a calm place within us. Dear God, we thank you that there is peace available to us at all times and that we have nothing to fear, that you are guiding us every step of the way, that we are headed directly towards the highest and happiest experience of life according to your will and that you would show us what needs to be done, when it needs to be done, who it needs to be done with, that you would in fact guide every single step of the way. We will step back and let you lead the way. Thank you for the healing of all of our relationships that we would come to know the light of holiness in each and every person, that we would see that with you, and then we would know this within ourselves. May your will be done. Amen. Oh, those relationships, right? <laughs> That's the toughest part sometimes. Some of our relationships are great, of course, but I have to say that practicing A Course in Miracles is probably the toughest when it comes to relationships because we do forget again and again that other people are playing roles with us in our own dream. You know, not much different than our nighttime dreams that when we go to sleep at night and then we see those people out there in our dream and they seem to be doing all kinds of things, sometimes good, sometimes not so good. And what if we could realize in the middle of that dream that we are dreaming and that the people we're looking at are not exactly real. They sure look real. They seem to be doing real things. They certainly represent something. What do they represent? And we've been given a guide even here in this dream to help us to wake up and to remember what is real, what is true and what is rightfully ours. So today, this topic of practical application, you know, we've heard about holy and special relationships. We've talked about those steps that we need to be able to move towards the healing in our relationships. We've talked about a, a ton of A Course in Miracles quotes to back up what it is he's asking us to do. But today, I'd, I'd like to get to that place of what do you do, you know, when you're in the face of a challenging situation? You know, sometimes it's another person that you are very connected to, someone that you have a lot of time and frequency with, or it might be someone at work that you see occasionally. It might be someone that cuts you off on the freeway. You know, where did they come from? Right? And you might just get frustrated. I used to have a big commute when I worked in private industry and also public accounting, I would commute about, oh, 45 minutes each way. And that could easily turn into an hour and a half or two hours, depending upon the day and the traffic. So I would spend a lot of time in traffic. Not anymore. I think that's by the grace of God. <laughs> but as it was, there was all kinds of things going on in that freeway. And yes, sometimes I would get cut off or sometimes I'd be trying to get off the freeway and it seemed that no one would let me over and I could be right about my grievances again and again and again. You know how that feels, right? When you see other people and they seem to be so independent of us, don't they? They're just zooming by. They seem to be careless. They seem to not see us or want to help us out. And maybe we're out there trying to do the right thing all the time. It's very easy to form a judgment around that, isn't it? When you're in the face of that experience, you could very quickly say, oh, that person, they're so rude. They're so uncaring. Uh, they're so mean. You know, all I wanted to do was get over and they just had to get right in that space. And we can form this whole grievance in our mind. 
But what I love to do is to look deeper because once we understand that we are the dreamer of our dream and we are looking at the story that we made up, hmm, things get a little different because what we're looking at is the outpicturing of our own belief system. So if we don't like what we see, we actually have the power for that to be changed. And we have a perfect guide to help us change it. And what we can do in that moment, say someone's cutting me off and my temptation is to judge them, get frustrated with them and reaffirm that the world is unfair and it's filled with this darkness and people that don't care, people going too fast. And so instead, what if I pause while I'm driving? You know, we have lots of time when we're driving, we are just driving and we can start thinking about what is going on here? What is this situation trying to convince me of? It doesn't mean that I have a tainted mind or that I'm a bad person or that I'm a person that is convicted of all of these judgments against myself and others. Don't take it to a deep level like that. Just realize that maybe as the holy child of God, we have allowed some thoughts to be in our mind, just given them consent. Thoughts like darkness is real. Thoughts like God is not so powerful, and maybe there's this other power that we have to fight against. You know, the moment we let that idea of darkness into our mind, we pretty much have on our boxing gloves and we have to fight against it. But right there in the car, when that person cuts you off and they're already way down the road, what if you just pause and say, I think this is trying to convince me that people are careless. They don't care about others. They don't make room for others. They don't have time for others. Or maybe it's about me. Maybe I don't feel like I'm very loved in this world or I'm not very valued. What is this scene trying to convince me of? If it's supported by my belief system, what must be my belief system? Hmm. Not as a means to judge yourself, but as an as a means for awareness of some thoughts or ideas that you might be allowing in your holy mind. And once we get a little hold of what that might be, now we can take it to prayer. And that's what Miracles in Prayer is all about. The, the book that I actually wrote down in two days. If you ever read that book, I want you to imagine that it was written in two days flat. <laughs> Just one after the other. When the Holy Spirit has something he wants you to say, he wants you to do it. And so I I wrote a lot of prayers in a couple of days. But those prayers are about the healing of our mind. It's not about prayers of supplication like, God, please fix that person that just cut me off. Or God, please make it so nobody cuts me off ever again. Instead, those prayers go back to the root. And we are saying, dear God, would you please heal that place in my mind where I ever decided that I should be mistreated or cut off or not treated with love and kindness and care. If I have that in my mind, if I have given that consent, would you heal that for me? I want the truth instead of this or something along those lines. And you can pick up that prayer book at freeprayerbook.com. You can download a copy right after this service, freeprayerbook.com, 150 prayers for everyday living. And you will find that they are different in the way that we are asking for the healing at the root of the problem instead of at the level of the problem. You know, if you had a flooded front yard and you couldn't figure out what was happening there, why is my lawn flooded? And maybe you kept bucketing the water or brushing away the water with a broom and there it was again and again. Well, eventually you'd have to think to yourself, where is this coming from? And you might find it's in your backyard. Maybe there's a faucet that blew a gasket and, (laughs) you know, there's your faucet running in the backyard. It's flooding your front yard all the way around the house. Well, then when you find that faucet, you could certainly fix the problem. Here's our faucet right here. And the problem we're looking at in that front yard, that's the life that we see. So we have to come back to the faucet. It doesn't mean that we are flawed or incomplete. It just means that the holy child of God has allowed some thoughts to be in their mind that are not based on the truth. 
And because we are that powerful, we are the children of God, we can actually hold these thoughts in our mind and we can project them as if they're real. And then we see them, we touch them, we feel them, we smell them, we can see everything that we were thinking before. And of course, we might just use what we see to believe that it's real. And we can do this at night. Thank goodness for our nighttime dreams. Otherwise, we would not know what he's talking about when he says it's projection. It's not reality. You know, if you're chased by a bear in your dream tonight, wouldn't it be wonderful in the middle of that dream to say, hey, wait a minute. I think I'm asleep and dreaming. And that bear, he's not even real. Heck with this. I'm not going to be running from this bear that I made up. And if we could pause long enough to question the story, then we can make room for the guide that we've been given through the Holy Spirit. And the guide guarantees our success, guarantees our awakening. So we have this help, but you won't feel like that help is there for you until you're done with the story. And most of the time that story involves another person because that's where our ego really gets into us is with our special relationships. That's what it calls it in A Course in Miracles, where we think this other person is a body and we are a body and we've got these differences and different places of mind, different ways of seeing things. And then we believe we are separate. We are different and we are convinced, but it's still not true. Today, as we talk about some of those practical applications, you know, it might look like a few more steps, but I want you to start to think about these steps and the application as part of your normal day. The more that you embrace these things and allow this to become of your normal thought process, you're going to see your relationships heal right in front of you. You might have seen that already. Perhaps it's with people at work or at home or even strangers you meet on the street. Today, I have a little miracle story. It's called being in alignment with myself. When I was first studying A Course in Miracles and I just fell in love, I loved it. I was like a sponge with water. I wanted to read and know and understand what it was saying because it seemed to answer my questions that were unanswered. I had always known God my, all my life. I'd always prayed. I did those things kind of at the surface level that I was taught, but I still felt like there was more that I didn't understand. I couldn't yet explain why bad things happen. I couldn't understand why God would let bad things happen. I, none of that made sense to me. And so as much as I loved God, you know, maybe there was a little fear of God or maybe that I didn't know what to do or that I wouldn't have enough faith or that my own kids would suffer in some way because I didn't have the most perfect thought forms or that I wasn't doing it the right way. I started reading A Course in Miracles and it just made sense. And it helped to bring the fear down in my mind. And then the peace that's naturally within me, that started to come up and I could feel it. And the deeper I would go, the more peaceful I would feel, the closer to God I would experience. So today, as I look back at being in alignment with myself, what I can tell you is when I first started studying A Course in Miracles, I was not in alignment with myself. I wanted to believe in this loving God. I wanted to see myself as blessed. I wanted to understand that I had a right to happiness and for things to work out, but that wasn't what I was seeing. And so for a while, I think I had this quiet little doubt in my mind and I learned these things to be true, but I didn't feel or know them to be true yet. And while I was not in alignment with myself, what I started noticing is that different people would attack me randomly, sometimes mildly sometimes pretty aggressively, not necessarily with their fists, but with their words, their moods, their attitudes, I would have people come out of nowhere and just start yelling at me. And I thought, what is going on? Because I didn't really have that before. But as I was really trying to stand on the truth and learn the truth, what I didn't understand yet is that our ego fights back 
It doesn't want us to know the truth. It doesn't want us to remember God. And so when we start studying those things, the ego goes from suspiciousness to viciousness. And that's what was happening to me that even in some of my own relatives were attacking me on Facebook, I had to block them. I had different people come into my home and just light up on me and, and tell me I'm doing all these terrible things. And I was thinking, wow, you know, they talk like I'm a bank robber or something. I'm, I'm teaching love, you know, love, forgiveness, you know, forgive yourself, move forward, try to come from love, you know, all these terrible things, right? So I, I knew it didn't make sense. But what I came to realize is that the reason it was happening and the reason it was affecting me so much is that I was not in alignment with myself. I wanted to believe the truth. It sure sounded good. I wasn't seeing it yet. And so I was trying to reconcile those two, like what I believe to be true and what I see to be true. And they were out of whack. <laughs> and so I think I was using that out of whack condition to nurture my doubt. And I felt like what God told me one day is you have to stop doubting me. Just stand on the truth anyway. He said, you know, you're not going to see the truth until you choose to see the truth. You can't wait until you see it in order to believe it. You will see it after you believe it. Well, we can't just believe something because we want to, but we can certainly choose to believe something. You know, if a good friend of yours told you something and you've never heard that before, it didn't make sense to you at all, but you trusted them, they seem to be a trusted source. You would certainly give it your best to try to understand them or welcome that thought into your mind and, and try to See if you can find your way through it. And I think that's all he's asking is I'm giving you information to help you understand that this is how you got where you are. This is what you can do about it. This is the guide that I have given you. This is how to access that guide. And once you make the decision that you're done with that story in the dream and you're willing to redirect your time and attention to what I'm telling you is true. And you lay down your doubt, just lay it down, be willing to, then you're going to see things differently. Well, it took practice. And those people that would show up to play a negative role with me each and every time I would have to practice, I would have to go to the truth. I would have to say, dear God, this person showed up today and they either started yelling at me or saying these terrible things to me, or they called me and hung up on me, or, you know, there was all these things happening and they made no sense at all. Sometimes it seems so unreasonable. And I would say, dear God, will you please help me to see them differently? I want to see them differently. You did not create your children to be mean or difficult or attacking or to harm me or to make my life miserable. This is not your will. And it is not my will. I'm going to lay down my doubt because it's really hard for me to see right now that this person could be capable of being a light filled presence in my life. Maybe that's really hard to see, but I choose to see it anyway. I want to see. In fact, he says you need to go from I'm willing to see this differently to I am determined to see this differently. And we have to get tough with ourselves not in an attacking way, but we have to apply our will. You know, sometimes we ask things of God, almost like God is going to just do everything and just place it in our lap. And sometimes that's true. But while we have a decision against what we are asking for, it's going to be really hard to receive that miracle or that correction. So we have to take our own will and maybe there's a person in your life right now that is very difficult in some way, whatever that is, they might just be unpleasant, they might be complicated, they might take up too much of your time, they might cost you too much money, they might, it might feel like they are a drain on your energy, your well being, it might feel like they're a terrible influence to your kids, whoever that is. Are you willing to see them differently? so that this problem can stop? Or 
are you pretty convinced about who they are? Because you've seen it so many times in a negative way. Are you saying, God, please heal this person and straighten them out? And then I'll see them differently. Or are you willing to see that person as you've been seeing them and say to yourself, I am the dreamer of my dream. I'm looking at a story that I made up. God is telling me this is not the true story of this person. God himself is telling me this. God is saying, this is not what I have made. This is a story you have consented to in your mind. And if you will choose again and be committed to that choice, I have given you a guide that is going to heal the part of your mind that is producing this story. And then you're going to see the effects of that healing. But are we committed to seeing this person differently? Or are we just kind of waiting around to see if God's going to fix them so that we feel better? Sometimes it's the latter. I've done that too. I have to say it doesn't work very well. <laughs> you know, we just wait around for God to do this magical healing so that they will be what we want them to be. Well, we can wait a long time for that. But we must be committed to who they really are. Who are they? They are the holy children of God, each and every one. In truth, they can only bless our lives. And I had to realize this in my own story that even these people that were showing up as attacking or negative or disruptive in my life, I had to realize as the course says, these are my saviors. <laughs> Didn't feel like it. They are my saviors because they were showing me and even acting out this experience in front of me to let me know that I had a belief that other people can be a dark spot in my life. And there they were acting it out. They were being the dark spot. And my ego is trying to hold that idea in place. And the Holy Spirit is trying to free me from that thought form. But you see, if you have people right there in front of you acting out what it is that you believe that is holding you back or holding you down, it is a gift. It doesn't feel like a gift at the time. I'll give you that, right? But there they are in front of us. They're acting out this story. It's almost like they're carrying, you know, signs and posters that say, I represent, you know, a person that will never give you what you want. I represent a person that will not respect you. I represent a person that will make sure that I get in the way of everything you would like to create in your life. You know, they sure have some nice posters, don't they? But if we can look at what's on that poster and we can choose again, how do you do that? I think, first of all, we have to look at what do they represent? What is this trying to convince me of? I think that's a great starting point. I feel like Jesus himself told me to start that way. You know, it's almost like you have a backpack that's full of heavy rocks. And those heavy rocks are beliefs that you have that are weighing you down. Like other people are a detriment or other people fail me or other people disappoint me or other people don't give me what I want. So there's those rocks in our backpack. And the way for those rocks to be healed is other people will come up to you. This is a little example. Other people will come up to you. They have to reach in your backpack, reach in there, pull out one of those rocks and show it to you and act it out so you can see it. They don't know they're doing that, of course, but they are. They are the figures in our dream that are acting out actively what our unhealed beliefs are. And so when we see them act out this big, heavy belief that we've been carrying that's weighing us down, like I'm not loved or I'm not appreciated or I don't have answers or no one's helping me or I'm unsupported. Every one of those rocks is back there. Well, someone will show up, reach in there, show you that rock, that big, ugly belief that you've been carrying around. And now you have a choice. Do you validate it? And you get to be right about that belief. You get to carry it longer. So the person puts that rock back and guess what? Another person gets to pick it out another day. Or will you pause by realizing I am the dreamer of my dream. I am looking at the story I made up 
And will you pause and refuse to validate what you're looking at and instead choose again? And of course, forgive them all the way through it for being one of those rock bearers. That's what I had to do in this situation. Because when people are being really unkind, almost attacking or even hostile, it's really easy to jump into judgment and feel defensive and vulnerable and powerless. But I would pause as much as I could, even during the situation as it would unfold, I would pause and I would say, God, will you decide for me about this? My goal is peace right there in the middle of the conflict. Pause, say to yourself, my goal is peace for both of us, not just you, but the other person as well. Always include everyone. There is no separation. But as you say, my goal is peace. Holy Spirit, what would you have me say? Give me the thoughts. Tell me how to respond, not how to defend myself, not how to make them wrong, not to how to talk them out of what they're doing. That's all illusion stuff. Just set the goal of peace, even in the middle of the conversation, if you can remember. If you can't remember because you're feeling so rattled and broadsided, that happens too. Try to do it as soon as you can. But see, to the degree that you react to what you hear or see, or you, I call it squeezing the ketchup bottle, like when you have anguish and frustration and anger and rage and you squeeze the ketchup bottle, that ketchup goes flying. And the problem is, is it's going to land on your timeline at a future time and place that you will not like, and your ego will use it for advantage. So by squeezing that ketchup bottle, that means that we are validating what we see and it's landing there in front of us. So I had to learn, I was not in alignment with myself, that even though I wanted to know the truth, I was practicing the truth underneath it. I had doubt, I had worry, I had fear, and that's okay. It doesn't mean that we have to have a perfect mind, but I think at the time I was more committed to maybe I'm not doing this right. Maybe I should hear this better. Maybe I'm not listening good enough. Maybe other people get it, but I don't. You know, doubting thoughts can sometimes have a home in our mind. And so I just decided one day after the Holy Spirit's beautiful counsel to stop doubting myself. And maybe you can do that today. If there's self-doubt, what if you just stopped and said, you know, if I am feeling guided to do this particular thing, I think I'm just going to trust it. If I'm being guided to say this specific thing, I'm going to trust it. If I am in a situation where I need God's help, I'm going to accept it and let God show me my way through it. Instead of challenging everything we do and think and feel as wrong or should have been better or should be right. When we do this, the ego has our attention, which also means the ego is guiding us, coaching us, which also means the ego is determining the outcome we will have, which we will not like. Once I realigned with myself so that my thoughts, my words, my actions, my behaviors started to be in alignment, you know, all four at the same time in alignment as much as possible. No one's perfect at this. But we want to be perfect at this in a way that we are in alignment with ourselves. If we would like to live a more abundant life, do we talk about abundance? Do we do abundant things? Do we think about abundant outcomes? Or are we thinking mostly about lack and suffering and sacrifice or losing something? If we want to live a life that's based on a really loving, happy, wonderful relationship, and maybe the relationship that we are in is not that, are we spending time each day thinking about that relationship being healed, being fulfilling, happy, loving, respectful, peaceful? Are we spending time investing in what we want? And that's where we get out of alignment because we might be thinking saying we want a really loving, happy relationship. We might be doing some things like praying and trying to figure out what's going on here. That's true. You know, we might be feeling like we'd like to have a happy, 
harmonious relationship. But maybe what we're thinking is way out here. <laughs> what we're thinking is that this person will never be able to do this. This person is a mess. This person will never show up the way that I would like them to show up. And maybe underneath the feeling and the actions and the behaviors that the thinking is completely sideways. And then you will feel stuck. And your ego is your coach at that point, because the investment is still in what the person is not. And again, it doesn't require perfect thoughts. But once I kind of got my thinking back over here aligned <laughs> with the other three, and I refused to think about these people as they were showing up, they were showing up in a negative way, but I would pause and I would choose to see them in the light of truth. It took a lot and it took practice to get good at it. But do you know the benefit is they stopped showing up that way. For a while, it was pretty consistent. I would have a lot of conflict around me. I wouldn't provoke it. I wasn't causing it to my knowledge, but I would have people show up and just light up on me and be really difficult and hard to talk to. But as I would practice being committed to who they are instead of who they are not, and I, I kind of pulled up my tent on that other side and I was unwilling to invest in the story that I saw in front of me. And I just said, nope, no more. Get over here on who they are. And I'm going to lay down my doubt, all that doubt about them or me saying they can never show up in a better way. I mean, look at them. They've never done that. So I stopped doing that. And then these people stopped showing up in my life. And I really do find myself today surrounded in love. People go out of their way to help me. People in stores or airports or, I mean, if I happen to leave something behind, somebody will run it to me. Like, I, it's just, it's mind boggling because that wasn't my life. I used to live a life where I felt like I was the only one fighting for me. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever felt that before, but you kind of feel like you're the only one in the ring against the world and you've kind of got to figure it out because it felt like there was no one else in your corner. And after this practice, not only do I feel God's presence in my life in every way, but the people that show up, like the ones I'm talking to right now, pure love, pure love. I bet I could call any one of you in the middle of the night and you would be kind to me <laughs> and you would help me as I would help you. And I have found myself now surrounded in a life of love. My children, we have six children between us. We have 14 grandchildren so far. And everybody is just this beautiful presence of love. We love being together. We love doing things together. It's just become a life of love. And I know it's because of God and his promise. So as we practice the healing in these relationships, just keep in mind that you want to be in alignment with yourself. That if you are choosing to see this relationship, whichever one it is, as being capable of being healed, you've got to spend some time imagining that it is. Seeing that other person as capable of rising up and, and being who God created them to be, not changing into it. We're not getting this other body to morph into a better body. We have to realize that the image we are looking at in this person, that's not the truth of them. That is the projection. And if we will go back and reinvest in the truth of this person, then the Holy Spirit is going to give us the vision to see the truth in them. And we will see the effects of that healing in our lives. So let's talk about a few of these practical applications and gentle reminders on a practical level. So this is less about A Course in Miracles quotes today and just more about learning and things that have really helped me along the way as guided by the Holy Spirit. So number one, for any relationship where there is conflict or discord, offer the relationship to the Holy Spirit 
to be purified and made holy. And we talked about this the last time that if your relationship is out of whack, and that could be your spouse, it could be your boss, it could be your employee. If something is out of whack, take it to God. Every relationship is capable of being healed. Do not put up with the unhealed condition. You are not stuck in it. It is not God's plan for you to be stuck in this relationship. Just pause. You can do it as simply as, dear God, I've got this trouble in this relationship. It's this way, that way, the other way. I give this to you. And I ask that this relationship be made holy and purified. Will you show me the true love between the two of us and that we are not here to be in conflict? We are not here to have differences. I am willing to see this person in the holiness that you created them and recognize that they can only bless my life. Will you help me to see? Will you give me the vision to see it? And we're actually asking for his vision, not our own. I think I had to realize that too. I kept thinking it's almost like Jesus in my head, working out my vision and helping me see better. And he said, no, no. He said, there's only one true vision and it's what God created. And he said, I have that. You have that too, Robin, but you're asking for my vision. He said, actually, you're asking for my vision. You're not asking for yours to be fixed because yours has really never gone off track. You only think it did. And because you think it did, now you're seeing it as if it has. So don't worry about fixing your vision. In truth, it's never been messed up. But you can ask for my vision because my vision is very clear and you can borrow it anytime. I call that a workaround. So the Holy Spirit, we ask for your vision to see this person differently. Help me to see them as you see them and love them as you love them. And will you make this relationship holy? I will let you. I will not doubt you. I will not interrupt you. I will celebrate that I am here to receive a healed relationship. Thank you that it is done. And he says, when you ask for a miracle, pause and receive it. So I started adding that in. So when I asked God for the miracle of a healed relationship, just take a moment, breathe it in and imagine it's done. And he said, yes. The next one, other people are your saviors because they are mirroring your unhealed beliefs back to you. And instead of fighting or defending or attacking them, you can choose again and make a better choice with the help of your guide to peace. So even if that person, you're out on the freeway, they cut you off, you know, something like that, you can pause right there and you can go to God and you can say, God, you know, this person just cut me off. Help me to understand that you did not create your children to cut each other off or to be difficult or a, some kind of a dark spot in our lives. Will you give me the vision to see them truly? Help me to see all of your children as loving, kind, supportive, even protective, going out of their way to help one another. Thank you for the vision to see. Amen. See how simple that is? You're already driving. You have time on your hands. So acknowledge the problem and then go north. That's what he told me. Going north means go where you'd like to go. Acknowledge what's going on. That's fine. Give that to God. And then go where you would like to go with your thoughts. And then thank God in advance for helping you to really understand and receive that blessing. For every situation, Set your goal of peace and let your guide to peace direct you in everything you do. Now, I know we can't remember to do this every single time, but let's do it a lot. <laughs> let's do it most of the time. Just my goal is peace. My goal is peace. My goal is peace. Now, why is that important? It's important because when we're engaged in the problem or the conflict in the relationship, we're trying to fix it, we're trying to set parameters, we're making demands, we're writing lists, we're telling this person, you need to do this, you're not doing the right thing. You know, we're very involved, right, in the experience of the relationship. That also means we're very engaged in our illusion. And we just have to understand that we are that powerful. We can project 
images. We can project an experience and it can look so real. We are the holy children of God. We do have that crazy little gift, right? So we're looking at this experience and we're very tempted to be head first involved, but let's pause. We reset our goal to be the goal of peace instead of fixing the person, instead of getting them to do what we want, instead of watching for them to do the right things. What if we paused, lay that down? You don't have to do anything with it. Just lay it down, redirect, set your goal of peace for this relationship right there. And you're just letting go of needing to fix or change or manipulate or get what you want in the illusion, just in your prayer time, you're reinvested in the goal of peace. And the goal is for both of you. It needs to include everyone. And the moment you do this, you're engaging the teacher of peace. And the teacher of peace is the one that has the answers that you're looking for. The one that's going to heal the part of your mind that is projecting the problem. So that's why the goal of peace is so important. It's not just important because you want peace. Of course we do. But the moment your goal is peace, you have just agreed with God on what the goal is, the one true goal. When you agree with God about what you want, then the Holy Spirit has been given you to fulfill the healing and to fulfill his function. So just keep in mind, the Holy Spirit cannot fulfill his function while we are over here breathing life into this story by wanting it to change, wanting it to be different, wanting that person to do better and be more and, you know, get, do what we want or give us what we want. So just in your prayer time, turn all of that over to God, lay down your need to change it at all. Let it be, let all things be exactly as they are reinvest in the goal of peace. And when you do, you have just engaged the guide to peace that is going to bring the healing. Ask yourself, will I redeem this person or will I crucify them? And then act accordingly. And of course, we want to redeem them. Why do we want to redeem them? You know, there's so much in every decision. Every decision is for God or against God. Every decision is for peace or against peace. Every decision is bringing you towards a more peaceful outcome or away from it. He said, in truth, you are always either redeeming someone or you're crucifying them. You have to understand that even those little annoying thoughts or judgments, they all lead towards absolute elimination. Like I'd be better without you, right? So we want to pause. We want to redeem other people. Because when we redeem them, it means that we're leaving room in our mind to imagine they could heal, to imagine we could heal, to imagine that our relationship could heal. So when we redeem someone, it means we're leaving that place in our mind to see things differently. We're not carrying the resentment. We are not holding on to the judgment. We are not wanting to crucify them with our mind, right? We are going to stand down on the judgment leave room for redemption, meaning things could get better. And then we're going to redirect and invest in a very peaceful outcome guided by our teacher of peace. This is from my husband, Terry. This is one of his favorite phrases. He says, do to them what you would like them to do to you. It's kind of like the golden rule, but it's about actions. You know, if you're asking for someone to do these five things to make you happy, they might be reasonable things. They might be things that you really like, but would you like it if another person said, I want you to do these five things to make me happy? You may not be as excited about that. So whatever you do, ask yourself, would I ask this of myself? Is this what I would want for myself? And then before you ask something of someone else, you know, just check in with that. Are you doing or saying or acting in your behaviors towards another person in a way that you would like them to act back to you and try to be consistent in what you are doing and what you would like to receive? You are the dreamer of your dream and you are doing this to yourself. That doesn't mean you're a bad person. It means that you're in the middle of your own dream. Once you realize that, that really is the starting point of complete healing. Because when you take ownership of that, that life is not happening to you, 
It's actually happening from you. Imagine how magnificent that is really and how powerful you really are. That if you look out into this world, you see and everything that's happening is actually coming from a projection in your mind. Imagine how powerful that is. And what could we accomplish if we were awake and if we knew who we are? This is what we can do when we're asleep. Imagine what we can do when we are awake. Once you recognize that you are the dreamer and it is coming from you and you refuse to judge yourself, but you hold that awareness, now you're in the sweet spot. For the Holy Spirit to heal the part of your mind that has this projection that you do not like, that is the function of the Holy Spirit. God gave the Holy Spirit that function the moment we thought we were separated from God. So we have a helper, a great, great helper, and that helper is eager to provide support. Only your thoughts can bring oppression, control, conflict, or limitation. You know, whatever you're going through right now, you might be thinking, well, this other person is draining my finances. This other person is exhausting me. This other person is making me feel unloved, unappreciated, undervalued. In A Course in Miracles, I, there's a paragraph that talks about this, and it says only your thoughts can bring oppression. So we have to address it here, not out there. It's not even in that other person. They're playing the role. If we don't feel loved, someone will show up and they will treat you as if you're not worthy of love. If we don't feel provided for, it will seem like somebody else is draining away our resources or they're asking us for something that we don't have. Other people are showing us what we have accepted into our holy mind that is not worthy of us. And all we have to do is choose again. But first we have to recognize what did we choose? And we can back into that. You can look at what you see and just back into it and say, what must I have decided to see what I'm seeing right now. If all of my thoughts are driving this, then I can take a look at that and then I can choose again. I have the Holy Spirit to reinforce me. The only thing lacking in any relationship is what you're not giving. I threw the book one time when I, <laughs> I was upset about something and I did a flip open in A Course in Miracles and I read that line that said, the only thing lacking in any relationship is what you're not giving. I threw the book across the room. It was not what I wanted to hear. And I wasn't feeling very loved or appreciated at the time. And then after I had my little tantrum, I picked my book back up off the floor <laughs> and I, and I thought, okay, what is it I think I'm lacking? And I had to really just be honest and get to the work of it, you know, not work like effort, but to really look at what he's saying. So what did I think I didn't have? I, I thought I wasn't supported. I thought I wasn't feeling loved. I thought I was being mistreated. And so what I did is I decided to turn up the volume on my love for this other person, my support for this other person, the things that I thought I was lacking, I turned up the volume on that. And it wasn't easy because it was easier to be mad at them and be right about the mistreatment. And what do you know? The situation healed. Hmm. You know, when we're trying to get something from another person, whether it's love or resources or right behavior, whatever it is we think we want, under that, we believe there's a gap in us that's not being filled. We're trying to get them to fill the gap. But you see, the ego uses that for advantage and will keep putting people in front of you that seem to go back to that gap. But if we will pause and instead of focusing on what they're not giving us that we need to fill our gap to close up that emptiness, if we pause and we start extending what we have, like love or support or encouragement or helping the other person to know that they're treasured and value valued. Do you see that your ego loses its grip on you because it's trying to get you to focus on the gap and you just push the gap out of the way. And you decided to come from the abundance within you and focus on the very things you thought you were lacking. So do you see it seals up that gap in your mind? I think that's why it's so brilliant. 
because the whole argument that you don't have this thing and you have to get it from this other person and they are the ones that have to give it to you for you to be happy, all of that dissolves when you start offering it to others from yourself. The gap disappears. When the gap disappears, it means you just switched gears from the ego being your guide and coach to the Holy Spirit being your guide and coach, because the Holy Spirit knows you're complete and there is no gap. The ego sees you as incomplete with always having a gap. So the minute you close that off in your mind and you come from this extension, even though it can be challenging in the moment, you'd rather judge them, but you get over here and extend what you thought you were lacking, you just close the gap in your mind and you just switched over to the teacher that is going to bring you your answer. And then I wrote for healing, it is helpful to offer the other person what you believe you are lacking and any other person that you happen to run into. If you feel like other people are not being kind to you in some way, then spend the day being kind to people, really kind, you know, extra kind. And the ego will lose its weapon against you. Never focus on the maintaining, the breaking up, or the starting of a relationship. Focus instead on your goal of peace and the truth of who you both are. Your guide to peace, the Holy Spirit, will accomplish the healing on your behalf. Now, sometimes we do feel called to step away from a relationship or go into a different scenario. He's just saying, don't let that be your goal. If the Holy Spirit guides you in that effect, you will hear it. And you will know what action to take, but keep your goal on union, love, togetherness, oneness, because even if you're guided to step away from a relationship you're in, as your mind is healed, the next person that you experience, you're going to experience a much higher form of loving relationship. So the goal is not to separate or figure this out. The goal is to focus on what is true within both of you. And then the guide to truth is going to show you what to do and how to get through it. Love makes no demands. So just think of this. It's a great reminder. It's straight out of A Course in Miracles. He says, love makes no demands. If you are demanding or you're asking somebody to do this or do that or else or this or that, I would say that there is inner work to do. Because again, when we're making demands, it's coming from a place that says, I don't have what I want and I need you to give it to me. I need you to act differently. I need you to show up in a different way. And when we're doing that, it means that we feel there's a gap within us. And so then it's helpful to do that inside work. You might just take a bird's eye view of the situation and ask yourself again, what is this situation trying to convince me of? It's trying to convince me that I'm not loved or I'm not allowed to have answers or people don't support me or no one is helping me with this or I'm stuck in this problem or there is no answer. Try to write it down. It's not up to you to heal it, but it's hard to turn over something to God that you don't understand yourself. How do you get a problem healed when you don't know anything about the problem? You don't even know you have a problem. So write down, dear God, I think I might have some of these beliefs. I must believe because I'm looking at it. I'm looking at a situation that seems to represent I'm not loved, that I don't get answers or things don't come easy to me or that I have to work super hard to get anywhere. You know, write those things down and then write, will you help me to see this differently? I give all of these thought forms to you to be healed and undone in my mind I want the truth instead of this. This is coming from a very awakened mind where you know that it's coming from you and not happening to you. And when you realize that without judging yourself, you're calling on the teacher that has been given you for this very moment. Like this is the sweet spot. When we realize we are the dreamer, we are projecting, but we don't mean to, and we don't want that anymore. And now we just need an answer. We've been given the answer. But as long as it's happening to you and the other person is the one withholding it from you and and the problem persists, then you're engaging your ego and your ego is not going to give it to you. Very unlikely. 
if you find yourself making demands or giving ultimatums, you have inner work to do. And I'm not saying that as a judgment, but if you're making demands outside of yourself, there is nothing outside of yourself. So you're trying to get something from where it does not exist. Everything is within us. God gave us everything, a full and overflowing cup of water, and it includes everything and it's within us. So the minute we're seeking an answer outside of ourselves, that's the ego's game. And we don't want to play it. Other people are figures in your dream and they are acting out the roles that you assigned to them. Probably one of the hardest things to understand, but once you recognize that this is what's happening, you will also be able to receive the guidance from the one that is offering you the answer. Remind yourself every day, if you need to, until you remember, I am the dreamer of my dream. I am looking at a story that I made up. It is not real. It is not true, not any more real or true than my nighttime dreams. It has no effects of its own. And I will not assign effects to what has no effects. I want the truth instead of this. And then try to understand that you are not looking at reality. Try to imagine you're in this nighttime dream. It sure looks real, but really try to understand that it's not real. You do have the capacity to project something and make it look real. The more you understand that, that what you're looking at is not real, the more that the Holy Spirit can show you what is real in your mind. But if you're committed to unreality as your reality, then true reality has to stand down until you wholly want that. He's very specific that truth and illusions are irreconcilable. When you focus on one, you forfeit your awareness of the other and you have to wholly want the truth. And so he's teaching you how to get there. He's not saying you're doing it wrong. This is terrible. Oh, terrible you. He's not saying that. He's saying somewhere in time, you said yes to something that never happened and you're very powerful. And now you're living it out as if it happened. And he's like, I'm trying to save you from this. You don't need to have this experience, but let's redirect and let's get back to what's true and real about you and everyone else. And he says, let me clean up the mess. <laughs> so he's just trying to help us out here. You are looking at projection, which is false. And this is blocking the truth from your mind. You know, it's almost like what we see is right there in front of us. I want you to imagine that the truth is right on the other side of my hand. You know, it's almost like I blocked the light from my eyes. It doesn't mean the light went out. It means I can't see it. So here's what we're looking at. And let's say the truth is right on the other side. So in order to be invested in the problem and the solution and getting everything right and filling the gap, I'm looking at my own hand and I will not know anything beyond it. And he's saying, put your attention, even if you're looking at this, put your attention on the other side of it see through and beyond the illusion in your mind, just know that it's not true. You're going all the way through and it's and you're pushing that out of the way. He says, that's what he needs to show it to you. You're not going to see it by yourself. It's his job to show it to you, but you have to understand that this wall in front of you that you see, it's not a wall. It's a belief system that is uh, very well entrenched. Pray about everything, especially those things and areas where you are unclear or uncertain. Be consistent in your thoughts, words, actions, and behaviors. If you were to write down the type of life that you'd like to have, whatever that is, just for fun, you know, I'd like to have freedom emotionally, spiritually, financially, physically. I'd like to have freedom. How much time of any day are you spending thinking about being free already? Planning for being free, talking about being free, making adjustments in your life so that if you were to experience this freedom, it would be like everyday fun. Or are you spending your life thinking about how you're not free and that you can't do what you want and you're frustrated by that? You know, like it's where do we invest our thoughts? And some people would say, well, that's Pollyanna, you know, like where you're trying to think about something when reality is over here. 
keep in mind that that reality that's over there, it's not reality. <laughs> so in this case, we can say no to that for a bit. And we can say yes to what we want, even just imagining yourself having a very free and happy life. And then saying, God, would you show me how that's possible? And then not deciding against the answer. The more clear and in alignment you are with yourself, other people are going to mirror this back to you. That's like my miracle story where I had to get in alignment with myself. I had to decide that what I was learning was what I wanted to learn. And it was meaningful to me. And I had to stop deciding against it within myself, stop seeing myself as imperfect and unable and lack of capacity. And the more I would just stand on God's my perfect guide, I'm going to trust it. The less that that whole dark influence would have a place in my life. Ask God or the Holy Spirit or Jesus what to do what to say, when to say it, and to whom. If you're walking into a conversation with a loved one that maybe didn't go so well yesterday and today you're going to try it again, set your goal of peace. Make your reservation for peace before you get together. Ask God or Jesus to enter before you, right before you walk in the door. Say, Jesus, walk in front of me. Will you guide our conversation? Will you show us what to say? Will you help us to find common ground? Will you help us to unify, help us to share love with one another? So you have a perfect guide. Let him in, let him guide everything. Follow what is peaceful and compelling. If you are not peaceful about what's going on or what someone said, pause, pray, ask again, wait until you feel some sense of peace before taking action. Maybe you think you need to talk to your son because he was really upset about something and you want to set it straight and he got it all wrong and you're tempted to pick up the phone and just start going straight out and trying to set everything straight. Pause. Because right now what you're trying to do is you're trying to fill a gap. You're perceiving a gap between you and him and you're trying to fill the gap very quickly with a shovel. You're trying to say, no, no, there's no gap between us. Let me tell you why. You realize if you do this, your ego is in charge of that conversation because you're engaging in illusion. So pause. Before you call your son, remind yourself about who he is. He is the holy son of God. He is invulnerable. He cannot be anything less than what God created him to be. He is holy. He is perfect. He is blessed. He cannot be altered by anything or anyone and not by what you said or did. He is as God created him and not what you have made of him. And also you are the same. Now we are clear about who we are, or at least we're trying to be. Now we can say, God, will you guide me in what to say and what to do? Not to fix the problem because that's an illusion. The ego's in charge. Guide me on what to say so we can have a peaceful outcome together. And now I'm invested in the truth. And now I inherit my teacher of truth. You see the difference? But get used to calling ahead. Use your resources. They're available all the time. So let that come through. But make room for him and then step back and make room for that answer. And what you might get is, okay, I don't, I don't feel like I'm supposed to call right now. But let's say two hours later, you do call. And he says, wow, that, that's good timing. He goes, I just took a break and I was just walking around. Maybe he's in a much better place. God knows these things and will set it up for your success. By the time you are faced with a problem or conflict, your ego is already involved. So you have to realize this. It's like starting out almost like a negative five. We have to get back to at least zero. By the time you're dealing with a problem, a conflict, a challenge, you're already engaging illusions. So we have to stop, redirect, take it out of the hands of the ego, turn the problem itself over to God, give the thoughts that are producing the problem over to God, and then start again. My goal is peace. My goal is not solving the problem. That's in the illusion. My goal is a peaceful outcome for everyone involved. Holy Spirit, will you show us how to get there? So we have to back out of ego influence before turning it over. 
very helpful. Pause and redirect your attention to your teacher of peace for guidance. Be willing to see the other person in every aspect of the situation differently. That sounds so simple, but sometimes we're looking at a problem between you and another person, and it just seems like there's no resolution. Maybe you just absolutely disagree about what the answer is. And you're just thinking, well, somebody's going to lose. That's the ego influence. The ego always believes that somebody must lose in order for somebody to win. Pause, back out of that. Give it back to God and say, God, thank you for a peaceful outcome where everyone is blessed. Everyone wins. This enables the Holy Spirit to guide you without interference. Remind yourself that resistance and persistence are the same mistake. You know, whenever you're resisting what somebody's saying to you or what they want to do, or you're persisting what you want to do or what you need to do, you are engaging illusions. And then the battle will feel very real and it will feel like people get injured in this. Pause. Give the problem over to God, the resistance and the persistence. Turn it all over and say, will you heal the part of my mind where I ever decided that this is what could happen or should happen? My goal is peace, a peaceful outcome between us. I'm going to set that goal and I'm going to call on the teacher of peace to accomplish the healing on my behalf. The way to move beyond illusions is to disengage from them and place them out of your mind. Now, that doesn't mean people like don't just stop talking to them and walk away. That's it's not about physicality. It's about in your mind where you're holding on to a position or a judgment or you're trying to fix or solve or wish or want or long for something to be different than it is. The way to move beyond it is disengage from your need for the thing or the relationship to change. Pause. Let that go. Redirect. Your goal is peace. Peace between you. Peace for everyone involved. Invite the teacher of peace. The Holy Spirit knows what you're trying to do. The Holy Spirit knows where you need help even more than you know yourself. The Holy Spirit is going to guide you in such a way that everyone is going to be blessed by the answer. But we have to realize that when we're fighting the good fight or we're slaying the dragon in the illusion or we're trying to train the dragon <laughs> when we're doing those things we're engaging the illusion and the ego is involved and when the ego is involved you're going to feel like there is no answer or like you're stuck or nothing's happening or not very much pause or the way to dispel illusions is disengage from them and place them out of your mind why because when you do that the holy spirit's already here and is eager to help you respond to your slightest invitation, but has to wait until you agree that you want a peaceful answer. You don't want to be right about the problem or right about what you want. You want a peaceful answer where everyone is blessed. Now you're in agreement and now the answers can be given without it being an attack on your mind. If you are not clear about what to say or do, ask again. Ask as many times as you need to. You might ask a hundred times in one day. That's okay. But wait until you feel peaceful and compelled about what you hear or think, and then take a step, but trust the step you take, whatever it is. Don't doubt yourself. I want you to be doubt free, <laughs> be committed to being doubt free. Just like, okay, God, I think what I heard you say is that I need to do this. I'm going to go ahead and do that. I'm going to do it with my faith and my trust. If there's something you want me to do differently, you just tell me and I will. But for now, I'm going full steam ahead. Trust the guidance you receive. It's when you start doubting and you say, I wonder if I'm hearing God. I wonder if I'm listening to my ego. I wonder this. I wonder that you're listening to your ego. Only your ego offers doubt. There is a peaceful answer for everything. As long as you are listening to your guide to peace. I want you to think about every problem in the world right now. Do you know that there's an answer for that problem? There's a solution because with God, nothing is impossible. Nothing. No matter how big or complicated the problem seems to be. Nothing. 
So don't decide against your own answer because of the past, because you haven't seen evidence that there is an answer. God cannot get through that. God cannot give you what you have decided against. God cannot take from you what you are unwilling to give up. So be very neutral. Try to walk through life holding God's hand. I'll go with you wherever you want me to go. I'll back up. I'll go sideways. I will do what you have me do because then I am assured of the happy life that you created for me. With God, there is always a solution where everyone will win or be blessed. Try to see everyone as having no past as much as possible, especially if you have, you know, let's say a, a child, an adult child that's being very difficult or hard to live with or hard to deal with. Every day, shower them clean of the past and realize that they are not their past. They're not defined by their past. They are defined by God. You can say that in your morning prayer, dear God, please give me the vision to see my child, my adult child, as you created them. Perfect, holy, blessed, loved, cherished, stable, sober, harmonious, loving, kind. Help me to see. I'm not saying it. But I want to see, will you help me to see through and beyond my illusions? Sometimes that illusion can feel like a wall. You're not asked to break out your hammer and break down the wall. You are being asked to understand that the wall is not real. The ego makes it look real and impenetrable, but it's not. And if anything, Jesus can just walk right around it and take care of it for you. But the minute we decide that the wall is so tough and we can't get through it and there is no answer, he must wait until you change your mind. In order to hear the Holy Spirit, which is your teacher of peace, you will need to abandon or drop the story that you have on the other person. You know, maybe you have this story about this person and you think you're asking God to really help you about that story. And you're saying, God, you know, basically, will you improve the story? It's like you're watching a terrible movie and you're hoping God will go up in the screen room and change that reel so that this movie can morph into something more pleasing to you. <laughs> That's not exactly how it works. You have to look at the full story about this person that you have about them and abandon it for a little bit. Try to do it just for a little bit, because if you try to do it the rest of your life, you just give up and not do it. Try to do it for five minutes or an hour. Lay down the story completely. Say to yourself, what if I don't know anything about this person? What if they are not the story that I see? Would I be willing to see them differently or free of this story? We can't just keep the good parts and try to get rid of the bad parts and try to get God to fix the bat. No, that means we're engaging in the illusion and the ego is involved and the ego will use whatever it is that is engaging you for advantage. So if you stop with the story, just say to yourself, what if I am willing to let God show me who they are? Would I let God show me? Or am I so convinced that they are this person with these negative attributes? So be willing to abandon the story for a little bit be very committed to just seeing the light in this person and asking God to show you who they really are. In this way, you will come to know that same light within yourself. I call this exercise DWCP. You can remember those letters with dreamer willing to choose to protect. I am a dreamer willing to choose to protect. So let's say someone does something and it really upsets you, makes you angry, triggers you in some way. Try to remind yourself, DWCP, I am a dreamer willing to choose to protect. So what do I do? First step, D, say to yourself, I am the dreamer of my dream and I am looking at the story I made up. We just have to know where is it coming from? Right here, not out there. Right here, not out there. W, I am willing 
to see this person or this situation differently. This is so important because the Holy Spirit cannot give you what you're not making room for. So we've got a big story going on over here. You have to be willing to see this differently. Those are magical words about any problem you have. Say to yourself frequently, I'm willing to see this differently. I'm willing to see this differently. My goal is peace. Don't know how to get there, but I am willing to be shown. That prayer is power packed. C, choose again. I choose a peaceful and happy outcome for both of us or all of us. You can choose. He said, whoever is saner at the time can choose this. So choose Instead of this turmoil, this conflict, this problem I have over here, this person that's doing what I don't want, I am going to choose a peaceful, happy outcome for both of us. And I'm going to stand on that. And I am not going to give it up. And I am not going to doubt. I have a teacher that says he's going to deliver. I am going to trust him. And I am going to stop deciding against my teacher. And I am just going to allow this miracle to be given us. P. This is the toughest one. I will protect this person from my decisions against them or my story about them. Just think of this, whatever it is in this person that is so upsetting right now, are you willing to protect this person from your story about them? Maybe, maybe not. When you are ready to protect them from the story, it's going to change. Because if the dreamer of the dream no longer has an interest in that story, how long can a dream continue that the dreamer has no interest in and has abandoned in their mind? And every time you choose to protect this person from your story about them, that dream is changing because the Holy Spirit now can accomplish the healing on your behalf. Remind yourself that miracles are seen in light. And grievances block the light. When you're mad or angry, frustrated, really upset with someone, take some quiet time. Just be willing to see them in the light, like a big ball of light right in the middle of them, like the midday sun, so bright, so shining, so sparkling and wonderful. It doesn't mean you're making it happen. It doesn't mean that you're involved in the healing you're letting the Holy Spirit know that you're much more interested in who they are than in the story that you have made. And then the Holy Spirit can accomplish the healing. Practice forgiveness for yourself and for others every day. Try to hold no grievances. You know, if somebody walks in front of you or cuts you off or somebody says the wrong thing or you get the wrong order, try to pause, try to release from it. Try to give it to God and say, God, will you use this for the coming of my peace? Try to come away from that situation without a grievance. Try to not use it against anyone. And when you do this, the effect is you start living a life where mistakes just don't happen like they used to. Love holds no grievances. We really are trying to get there as a goal to be grievance free. No matter what you see, if somebody runs a red light in front of you and you, you know, your first thought is, oh, that's so dangerous. They could have hit that kid on that bike. And what are they doing? Why are they doing that? And how come they're going so fast? And they were speeding and pause. Dear God, I forgive them. And you know, what is this trying to convince me of? It's trying to show me that I live in a dangerous world and anything can happen and anyone can be injured. Wait, wait. I want the truth instead of this. God, thank you in advance that you created only safety, only love for each one of us. We are invulnerable in your name. We cannot be injured. It is not your will. It is not mine. And then make your left hand turn. It takes practice, but you'll see that your life changes because your investment in what people are not is dissolving and your investment in what they are is being reinforced. And we have the reinforcer right there with us. There is no guilt in God. And there is none in me and none in this other person. I read that in A Course in Miracles and I just really loved it. And I remind myself there is no guilt in God. 
and there is none in me. Whenever I feel guilty or tempted to judge myself or see myself as flawed or inadequate or unsupported, there is no guilt in God and none in me. Now, I'm not causing the healing. I'm inviting the healer every time I say this. There is no trace of guilt that has ever touched this other person. You're reminding yourself of this every day. The more you recognize that guilt is an election, it's a projection, it's not a fact, and you refuse to assign guilt, that's when you're really going to start to see that innocence in other people and innocence within yourself. And you're going to find yourself living in a much more loving world. In order to have a peaceful outcome, you must invite the teacher of peace and give peace a home in your mind. Let's say your house is very chaotic or your workplace and everybody's upset and frustrated and nobody's getting along and you're just in the middle of it all. Try to take some time, maybe sitting in your car or a park or in the bathroom, wherever you can find <laughs> some private time and ask God for help. Let him know that your goal is peace. And that you are pausing from the chaos and you're calling on his presence and peace is your goal and that you don't know how to get there, but you're calling on the guide to peace to accomplish the healing. So make room to call in the posse, right? <laughs> the ones that are there to help you learn to be quiet in the midst of turmoil for quietness is the end of strife. Easier said than done when things are crazy and chaotic, right? When you're in the middle of a really difficult situation, try to be quiet, try to make room for God and he will meet you there and he will carry the situation for you. He also says that the memory of God comes to a quiet mind. So even in the midst of chaos, try to calm your mind. You won't hear God in the chaos. It's going to be really hard for that guidance to get through. And that might be frustrating, but it's just kind of a fact. You're going to have a hard time hearing. If your mind is engaged in the problem or in the judgment or in the frustration or the anger or the rage, you're not going to feel like you're hearing God's guidance. Some people say, I never hear God. You know, you talk about this. I don't hear him. But usually it's because we're very involved with the other voice. So let God know that you're trying to hear him. Let him know that you're laying a white blanket out in your mind and you're asking him to guide you, that you want to hear his voice. Talk to him like he's your best friend and you're, you're just asking for his beautiful counsel. But be deliberate. Be convicted in what you're asking for. As if you were calling me and asking me for something. Know that when you're asking God for something, it will be granted. Go at it as if you know it will be granted. And if you don't know it, borrow my belief that you'll be heard. Just borrow it until you have that for yourself. In A Course in Miracles, it says you create what you defend against. Try to not be annoyed by that <laughs> because if you have body pain or you've got an illness or you've got a relationship that's on the rocks, it's hard to hear that we are the ones creating this. It's much easier when it's somebody else's problem or fault. But this is the place where the healing starts to form in front of us. We're not here to judge ourselves about what we're creating that is not good. We are understanding that what we are creating or projecting is not true. It's not real. It never was. And then the Holy Spirit has been given us to heal the part of our mind that's doing that and then show us that healing. And that's his function. We're not the healer, but we are the chooser. We are the decider. There are two uses for everything that is happening in your life, in your mind. One use is by the Holy Spirit. One is for the ego. When you are in the middle of a problem or a conflict with someone else, your ego is trying to use the challenge to reinforce your judgments, to reinforce the story you have about them or about you. The story that says that somebody is imperfect, somebody is guilty, somebody is unloving, somebody is not valuing me or my time. And when the ego is involved, your ego is also determining 
how this is going to go. Pause. Because you can turn this over to be used by the Holy Spirit to be used for his purpose. And his purpose is you, to bless you, to love you, to heal your mind, to show you something else, to give you another way to see this so that you can be done with the problem. In everything you do and every decision you make, you can ask yourself, what is this for? You know, let's say you're deciding to move. And, you know, it seems like a normal decision. I'm planning to move. Why? Ask yourself, why? Why am I deciding to move? Maybe I'm trying to get away from that noise upstairs. Maybe I'm trying to move closer to my kids because we're not talking. And if I move in the same town, we'll just have to talk. Do you see that your why might be for the purpose of filling a gap that you perceive in your mind or fixing a problem? Pause. You don't want to move for those reasons. When do you want to move? You want to move when God tells you it's time to move. Because then you know it's going to be a beautiful move. You know, if you're thinking about moving, it doesn't mean you can't do what you want. It's that you have a higher place within you right now that knows the perfect time to move, that knows the right people to get involved, that knows how to make this so smooth and easy and effortless. But if we decide without getting that counsel from the highest place in our mind, we're very likely to end up with a mixed bag of outcomes. So if you're thinking about moving and you think about why do I want to move, try to be clear with yourself. Am I trying to move to avoid something or fix something or try to get to a better place? All those things. If you are, pause. That's engaging illusions. And instead, go back to God. And say, God, you know, I'm thinking about moving. It's starting to feel like the right time. Is this your will? Is this the right time? Is this what you would have me do so that I could be, so that I could be assured of the highest and happiest move and outcome. And then from that place, let yourself be guided. There's two uses of everything. Typically in this world, the ego is already using it against you or against someone else you're going to probably have to pause and redirect. If you don't pause and redirect, you're going to inherit the teacher of pain and it doesn't love you. You might've noticed that already. So let's see here, moving forward. Every decision you make is leading you towards peace or away from it. If you're getting a new job, pause. If you're deciding between two options, You might try to decide based on income and proximity and the work and the people involved. That's illusions. You're engaging illusions. Guess who your guide is? Pause. My goal is peace, God. Which job would be perfect for me? Which one ensures, or is it something else? What would you choose for me so that I could have the most wonderful life and feel my contributions are just extended and cherished? What would you have me do? So before you decide based on a gap that you're perceiving that needs to be filled, pause, redirect. It's usually always with the ego already until you practice this a while and redirect and get your other guide involved. There's two uses. If you are not clear about what to do, ask yourself, Is this option or this situation leading me towards peace or away from it? And then choose based on what is most peaceful or least fearful. In this way, you are always moving towards God. You're awakening a more peaceful, happy life. It's all in the same direction. But if you're not sure what to do, you can always remember, you might highlight it. What is most peaceful for me right now? Maybe you're looking at two options or three, and none of them seem peaceful but you feel like they're the only options you have. Ask God, are these my only options? And if it feels like they are, you might ask yourself, what is least fearful? And then choose accordingly. Because if you're choosing away from fear, indirectly, you're always headed towards peace. There will be times when you are divinely guided to go twice as far as a brother asks, because it does not matter. God will let you know 
when that option is best. That's a teaching in A Course in Miracles. He says, go twice as far as a brother asks, because it does not matter. You know, let's say somebody asks you to, to do something you just don't want to do. You don't like doing. You have no interest in doing. And you have a lot of resistance around it. And let's say that you are practicing learning that anything God puts in your way can only bless you. And so you decide, okay, I'm going to go twice as far as this person is asking me and go ahead and do what they're asking me because I'm learning that God will never give me anything that would bring pain. I am just going to trust this and do what this person is asking me to do, lay down my resistance. And I'm not talking about abuse or being mistreated, but just say they ask you to do something you don't want to do. And you're feeling guided to say yes, even though it's not your first choice. Sometimes there's a teaching there, not for you to suffer, but for you to realize there's no need for fear. There's no need for resistance. That when God is involved in your decision, you're going to be blessed by it. And maybe that one thing you say yes to today that you normally wouldn't, you find a great big blessing at the other end of it. Maybe you meet the love of your life when you go to this place or, you know, there's always a bonus involved, but ask God, is this what you would have me do? And then try to follow what is peaceful about that. There is a difference between saying no to nonsense and in making demands. You know, when we're walking through life, it's fine to just say, no, thank you. I'm, I don't want to do that. Or I'd rather do this, you know, try to go with do only that, meaning telling people what you want to do instead of what you don't want to do. So it's okay to say no to the nonsense. If somebody asks you to do something ridiculous and it just seems like that's the purpose is ridiculousness, then you can say no or what you'd like to do. But when we start making demands of other people, we're stepping outside of love and we're trying to fill a gap that we think exists in our life or in our mind. And then try to pause, take it to God instead. Dear God, I feel like I'm missing all of these things in my life or in this relationship. Will you heal that part of my mind that thinks there is a gap? I want to see absolute wholeness in this relationship. Will you show me what is real and true? So take that list to God instead. That's what I would suggest and try to get back to that place of knowing there is no gap within you and there's no need for demands. In this way, you are staying in alignment with what is peaceful for you. You're saying no to what you do not want, but you're not demanding something of someone else. When you choose peace for yourself, you are blessing everyone. Peace is universal and it's always shared. The other person may not be aware that your peaceful answer or your response is a blessing to them, yet it will bring both of you towards a happier life. If somebody asks something of you and you just feel that it's not peaceful for you and you would rather take another road in your mind and it's more peaceful, I want you to know that when you're choosing peace for you, you're choosing it for me, for everyone. Peace is shared. The other person may not be aware that your answer or your response is a blessing to them yet, but it will bring both of you towards greater happiness. I would say hold the peaceful bar high and refuse to let it go. You might think you're in a situation where peace is not possible, but hold that peaceful bar high and stand by it. Nope. I asked God for help in this. Nope. I asked God for the healing of this relationship. I am standing by it. And God will show me if there's something in the way I will be shown, but I am going to plan on a happy, peaceful, remarkable outcome in this relationship. Here's an example. Let's say that someone asks you to do something you do not want to do. You can kindly communicate that you are not peaceful about doing what they are asking you to do. You do not owe anyone an explanation. There's no owing yet out of love. It is helpful to share information that will bring clarity to the other person about your decision. Just like what my husband says, do to them what you would want them to do to you. If someone told you something, but it didn't make sense to you, 
wouldn't it be kind and loving if they would give you a little more information so you could understand? That's it. It's just out of love. It's out of offering loving communication. In everything you do, try to imagine or maintain a goal of peace for everyone being blessed by your decisions, whether it's through teaching or a learning or just plain clarity and communication. The goal is that everyone would be blessed by this decision and always try to speak with love. And that's hard sometimes. You might be on a phone conversation or another person is being difficult or somebody just said something awful. Pause. Try to extend from love, speak from love, because that keeps you listening to love within you. If you go ahead and let your ego speak through you, you just inherited the other teacher and things will feel like they got off track. If someone is involving you in their decisions without your willingness or consent, it is helpful to communicate that you would like to make another decision for yourself, just out of love, communication, you are not choosing for them. You are choosing for you. You are making no demands on anyone because you know that when it's peaceful within you, it is a blessing to everyone. Be clear in your communication about what you prefer and then take steps in the direction of where you would like to go and be consistent with yourself. There is no need to yell, get angry, be confrontational, be mean or defensive. You are always at choice in what you are willing to do or engage in. So just try to keep in mind that you're always taking steps to go where you'd like to go instead of where you don't want to go. You're not trying to fight against what you don't want. You're simply choosing what you do want and you're taking steps to get there. And you're going to find that other people are going to show up in your life and go there with you. You're going to find that alignment right there with you. Choose to see the other person as God sees them and to love them as God loves them. This can be very difficult when you're upset with someone, but try to do it anyway and ask God for the vision and the strength to be able to do it. If you are having a hard time seeing the good or the innocence or the capability in another person, try to imagine them with Jesus sandals on their feet, almost like Jesus standing in front of you. You might even imagine them as Jesus with amnesia and they're acting this way, but it's actually Jesus right there. And then treat them as you would treat him if he had forgotten who he was for a moment. How would you treat him? You would probably try to remind him about who he is as you are also reminding yourself. So I love that in a, maybe you're in a group and everybody's in conflict or turmoil. Try to imagine that group as everybody has Jesus sandals on their feet. <laughs> Just helps you to get your mind back in alignment with seeing everyone through the eyes of love, seeing the light within them and letting the light of Christ respond to you. See everyone as whole and complete as God created them and accept nothing else and nothing less. And today we have a little prayer on this back page in your notes, and I called it asking for healing in relationship. So think about someone that could use a little healing in your relationship, someone that has been a little challenging, or maybe you've been seeing them as sick or sad or broken or inadequate or out of power or a drain on your life. And let's bring them into this prayer together. If you'd like to close your eyes, that's just fine. You could say, dear God, I ask for your guidance in my relationship with this person, this person. I've been seeing this person as imperfect, lacking, inadequate, or having less blank than what I want or would like to see. Help me to understand that I am not looking at the truth of this person. I am looking at my own made up story about them based on my own unhealed belief system. And this is blocking the truth from my mind. I wholly forgive myself. I want the truth instead of this. 
I am willing to see this person differently in all respects. I choose to see them as you see them and to love them as you love them. Please give me the strength to forgive them for all offenses that I feel they caused. I am willing to accept that I am the dreamer of my dream and I am looking at the story I made up. I am not looking at the truth. I am willing to see this person differently in every way. All power is within me and there is nothing outside of me. I choose to see this person as wholly capable of acting with love, kindness, strength, respect, and stability. I choose to recognize that you did not create your children to be a dark spot or a detriment in my life. I am determined to see them as a pure blessing in my life and nothing less. Please give me the eyes to see and the ears to hear. I choose to recognize only the light and holiness that you created within them, that I may come to know only the light and holiness within myself. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for healing the part of my mind where I ever decided that I could be mistreated or treated with less than love and kindness and respect. Thank you for teaching me that I am forever as you created me, wholly loved, blessed, safe, abundant, cherished, happy, provided for, and free at all times. Thank you in advance for the highest, happiest, and most remarkable outcome for both of us, according to your will and purpose. Thank you for your blessing on this relationship. I will step back and let you lead the way. We are in your very capable hands and our success is guaranteed. May your will be done. Amen. Take a nice, deep, relaxing breath. And if you did follow along with that prayer, you did something really important. You went to God. You're asking from God for the healing that you've been asking for. You're not in charge of the healing. He is asking you to be willing to see this person differently. He is asking you for peace in your mind so that he can bring you the answer and you will hear it and see it and know it within yourself. I call that a big prayer because you have taken responsibility as the dreamer of your dream and you are making room for an entirely different experience not even knowing what that is and that is trust and faith he says if you don't have your faith and you feel like your faith is not in place you can actually pray and you can ask god to restore your faith and he will restore it for you but you have to want that and you can ask for this today let's finish with a guided meditation. Let's call it the healed, happy, and harmonious life. Go ahead and take a nice, deep, relaxing breath, quieting your mind. We know that in quiet is where we hear the guidance of God, making room for that. And if you feel that you can't make room for that or your mind is too busy, just let God know that you want to make room, you're just having trouble and you ask for him to get through somehow, some way, anyway. Be determined. Stand on your conviction that you will be answered. Today we turn inward. We go to that place in the center of ourselves. 
the place of peace, the place of love. And whatever it is that you are experiencing in your life right now, something that you might want to be different than it is. Maybe you've tried everything you know and you are exhausted. You've tried to say no to nonsense. You've tried to take a stand for the truth. Maybe you're feeling worn down by the experience. Sometimes this can lead to a feeling of defeat or hopelessness. You might imagine that there's a big wall in front of you and that wall seems to be between you and your happy outcome. And you've tried everything you know to get around that wall, to break it down, to move beyond it. But today, let's let God take that wall. Let God decide what to do about that wall. Would you be willing to imagine that there is an answer because your guide is unlimited and perfect and has every resource available to them? Would you be willing to imagine that that wall between you and what you want or how you'd like it to be is not so thick? It looks sturdy. It looks impenetrable. But the fact is, it's not. It's an illusion. Your ego would have you believe that this wall could never be broken down. But today we are willing to be wrong about that. We are going to let God take care of the wall. We are going to rest and let go of trying to fix or solve or change this relationship to try to make it more happy, more loving, or more fulfilled. We are going to give all of it to God himself. And we are calling on the Holy Spirit to decide for us about how things should go from here. And we are taking this time to remember who we are we are the holy children of God. We are loved. We are safe. We are complete. In truth, we are perfect. We are eternal. We have every resource available to us. And we are willing to see the truth in every person along with us. Dear God, we are willing to be helped with this burden. We are willing to have you heal every error in our mind. We have no use for it. We have no desire to keep it or take it with us. We want the truth instead of this. Breathe it in as we rest. I want you to imagine that Jesus himself responds to you. He simply walks up and places his arm around your shoulder. And he lets you know that he has been waiting for you to give this to him all of it to be done trying to make it different trying to change it trying to make it how you would have it be but today is a special day because you're giving it to him for him to show you what can be done it is a holy day 
let him know that you have faith in him, that you are willing to trust him, that you do want him to decide for you about how this relationship can be healed completely. Today we offer our trust, a willingness to trust. And he takes his hand and he places it on the wall and the whole wall starts to disappear. It starts breaking into little pieces of light that simply disappear, completely undone. And with a great big smile, he asks that you take his hand as you walk through to the other side and you experience your relationship in its holy purified state. Breathe it in. Imagine this relationship at the highest level where you see this person as the beautiful blessing as they are, as they were created to be. Imagine this person being a gift in your life. Imagine this person being a gift in your life. Imagine your heart being so full, so happy, and there's not one thing missing. Imagine that every problem you thought you had has been undone and it's behind you. It's gone. Imagine feeling the height of happiness, feeling gratitude because every problem you thought you had has been undone and replaced with love and peace. Your life is healed. It is happy. It is harmonious. Imagine feeling so blessed that you couldn't think of one thing you would like to be different than it is. Imagine the love that God has for you to create a life like this. Take a moment to receive this gift, letting all things be given you, letting yourself receive what you've been asking for, letting yourself experience God's love in your relationship and in every aspect of your life. Breathe it in. Seeing this other person in the eyes of love. Seeing the light shining through their eyes. Seeing them show up as a loving presence that cares deeply and is always watching out for you making good choices, standing with God in their holy awakened mind. And you are one. Feel the peace, the closeness, the sharing, the contentment. Everything that you thought was off track has been healed breathe it in your life is healed happy and harmonious and you feel the blessing all the way to your core and now you extend that blessing to everyone seeing every child of God whole, complete, happy, 
and blessed. Breathe it in. Today, dear God, we see this other person as the light of your beautiful heart. They are as you created them. Thank you for the vision to see them as you created them. We have abandoned the old story and we are making room for healing in our mind, giving you that white blanket, the open canvas to show us what we had forgotten that is already there. We want to see. We are determined to see. We receive this miracle of the healing in this relationship because there is no order of difficulty in miracles. And with God, all things are possible. Take a nice, deep, relaxing breath and receive your miracle. Thank you, God, that your will is done and what you gave us is everything. We receive our divine inheritance in the light of your perfect love forever. We are wholly blessed. May your will be done forever. Amen. Now bring your awareness back to the room. I'm going to count from one to five. And when I reach five, you open your eyes and feel an entirely new level of an open mind, a joyful thought, celebration. One, Two, getting ready to emerge. Three, four, wiggling your fingers and toes. And five, opening your eyes and just seeing sparkles of love everywhere, on everyone, and smiles all around. And seeing that God has healed the world as you see it. And we are willing to see together. We are willing to receive all that is rightfully ours. Welcome back. All right, let's go ahead and come on back. And thanks for hanging in there with me with this topic of application. Hopefully that gives you some good ideas about what you can do in your relationships, especially when you are in the heat of the moment. Try to get to that peaceful place as quickly as possible. That's where you will hear guidance. Set your goal of peace as soon as possible. That's when you're tapping into your teacher of peace and you will hear the guidance. But just keep in mind, the healing is not up to you. Take that burden off of your shoulders and remind yourself frequently that what you're looking at is not the will of God. It's not the truth. He says, it is his will that you be saved from this. <laughs> so let's go ahead and let him do that. Let's let him show you something much happier in your life. Go ahead and come on back for the Miracle Cafe if you have any questions or you would like to apply some of these things directly or specifically. You can do that in the Miracle Cafe and we'll take a five minute break and be right back. <music> 